Okay, let's dis, uh, discuss realism and photography in chapter 27. <clears throat> so, two main things about realism <clears throat> that's going to come out of the Romanticism and the Industrial Revolution is empiricism, which is a focus on observing your direct experiences and the direct experiences around you. So there's no idealism, there's no heroicism, there's nothing contrived or fabricated. It is what you see is what you're going to observe and what you're gonna observe is what you're gonna render. There's no attention to studies. There's no attention to any schooling in regards to the classical field. There's no attention to any schooling in the romantic field. There's no schooling in any school of thought leading up to real. Realism is what you see is what you got kind of thing. And alongside the empiricism, which is observing what is happening in front of you, there is what's called uh, positivism. <clears throat> positivism and what positivism is it's the knowledge in their not belief that would be on the verge of religiosity but on the the knowledge that science and the laws of science are governing the activities around us so with the uh, invention of the industrial age this interest in complete observation in the moment without being skewed by any whim or skewed by anything adulterated in nature it's just this is what it is all right there's no hiding what you're observing in front of you there's no trying to connect it to anything else in the past all right and then with the new um, sciences the major new sciences like physics and chemistry in particular um, that is going to have a lot to do with this type of painting, this realism. And it's going to create new inventions through this focus on science. And we see that in photography. And photography will be literally a physical manifestation of this attempt at realism. That we're going to have this mechanical invention that's going to allow artists to capture exactly what is in front of them without any slight swoop of a brush that could skew what's being observed. So that's how important this realism is that we even get photography that comes out of it, which is about as realistic as you can get. You can't take a photo of something and say, oh, it was meant to look like this. No, it's observing exactly objectively what is in front of that camera so leading up to photography the realistic painters the the, the realism painters <clears throat> were trying to be objective and observe exactly what's in front of them without any subjectivity without any whim without any personal feeling about it it was just this is what it is so that's what realism is we're going to look at Colbert, we're going to look at Rosa Bonheur, we're going to look at Parquet, and we're also going to look at Monet and Tanner, and then we're going to look at a couple of photographers. All right, so we're going to start with figure 27, 26, Courbet's The Stonebreakers. And as you can see right away, um, he's painting matters... Um, that are objective this is this is their job this is what they do now by paint okay so by painting this quote unquote trivial scene which is something that would not have been considered high art in the past that's why it's quote unquote trivial but by painting quote unquote a trivial everyday scene and making it seem as if it's serious and it's serious because um, he's showing different elements of the individuals the young boy and the older man in tattered clothes 
certain very modest like soup can and spoon that's over to the right by showing them in this light in the honest objective light it actually takes something that's quote unquote trivial and makes it serious by seeing that these individuals that are working so hard are caught in this type of work and they may not be able to get out of it for generations to come for example the young boy behind the man is most likely the son of the older man which shows that the next generation is going to have to pick off where he left so it sets up this socialistic paradigm shift so by choosing to depict the uh, mundane or the trivial, uh, what's considered a low art subject, which is the everyday person, emphasizing on that, showing everything objectively, finding the exact same, exact, the perfect location in the activity to depict the scene, and then submit that into large exhibition spaces and be received then makes this quote-unquote trivial mundane low art a high art and it is used as a banner and a flag for social equality which is ultimately what's going to happen and what the realistic painters the realism painters are going to help promote especially in France and throughout Europe so he painted trivial matters to show control of the seriousness he wanted to control it like a science he wanted to control the scene all right like a science like we we're talking about with the positivism science controls the the environment so he as the artist becomes the scientist that's controlling the angle and the image that he wants to ultimately make what is called a low art a high art which is what realism does there's nothing heroic about these workers but at the same time they become heroic unintentionally by their placement in their actions being broadcasted if you will in large exhibition halls <clears throat> and what that's doing is it's controlling the importance of of the labor by painting them okay so he elevates them to a position beyond the tattered clothes and the modest lunch that they have around them and makes them recognizable at this time in around 1850 and these paintings of the everyday folks is going to become the uh, cry for social equality all right And again, he's just observing the truth in the activity. He's not he's not adding anything to it to make it uh, make it idealized or um, subjective. It's very objective. It's very true to what what's happening. And it, and again, the the main thing is like, will they always be this? Will they always be poor stonebreakers? Will they always be poor peasant storm, uh, stone breakers? And by setting up the arrangement between the youth and juxtaposition of the youth and the old, it's making it seem as if that's the case. But again, these paintings are going to change society a lot. And the middle class is going to get stronger and stronger based off of this type of imagery. Okay. So remember, empiricism, observing what is actually there, and then showing how science can dictate the environment. And in this case, with the stonebreakers, the artist becomes the scientist of, of observation to promote social equality. Then, Rosa Bonhia, Figure 2731, the horse fair. And what she is known for is animals, not wild animals, but domestic animals. Okay? Not necessarily figures, humans, but animals. Right? She's more interested in animals. 
and how this fits into realism is that it's a scientific accuracy in painting meaning she observed the anatomy of horses even when as far as going to slaughterhouses glue factories which is where a lot of horses go once they're old or they or they die and uh, studied the anatomy of the horse so that's the empiricism that's the observation that's the science is doing the research behind the object before portraying it she also created a panoramic composition where it bends on both ends the right and the left and a lot of that is with the um kind of um the competition with photography that's going to come up that's being generated at this time around mid 19th century early to mid 19th century is whenever the cameras are starting to become recognized so by creating this panoramic there's a study and again the science and the observation of the science with the lens that's used in photography so here she's bending panoramically both sides to reflect that of the lens that's used in photography at that time so kind of keeping in competition with photography because once we get into the photography there will be artists that are afraid and terrified that photography is going to take away the importance of two-dimensional art painting in particular some will see photography as a tool a mechanical tool to help promote painting and some will see it as a way or an avenue of mechanism removing the importance of studying painting so she bends the two sides panoramically again observation empiricism Imp i'm sorry um empirical empirical observation and another thing, she's just observing what horses do. Some of them are stable and equal posed, and some of them are wild. She's not trying to create an all calm horse or an all wild horse. She's showing what happens whenever they're getting ready to be paraded. They're going to go, you know, this way and that way. Some are going to be calm. Some are just going to jump and be wild. And this was so popular, this painting, the horse fair that she was one of the first to really create a print replica of the painting and sell it to folks that obviously well i mean there's this was the only painting that was done of the horse fair but it was so wildly popular amongst the middle class that prints were made and the prints were sold to everyone all right so observation in the animal kingdom not just observation in humans then I always want to try to touch on what sculpture is going on because there's not a lot of sculpture. Uh, there's mostly painting. So figure 2732, uh, Carpe uh, Ugolino and his children. And um, he studied and he was a student of Rude, what, what we just saw, the volunteers from 1792, all right, in the last section. So he studied with Rude, okay? And when you look at this, you should be able to see that there's Renaissance sculpture with Michelangelo. There's ancient studies of different styles from the Greek period. Um, and then the Baroque of it just being wildly emotional and dramatic and theatrical, like with the fingers in the mouth and grasping upon the leg. And what this is, is this is from Dante's Inferno when Ugolino tells Dante when he's being guided by Virgil through hell what disparity he had to experience by being trapped in a tower with his four sons and they all starved to death and that his sons told him please take our bodies and eat them and stay alive all right so there's even a level of that romanticism that horror that violence that's incorporated in this so Karpek is taking romanticism um, you know Renaissance Baroque ancient and all these different all these different sculptural techniques and all these different styles but he's also 
in the vein of realism. And, and it wasn't liked by the public because they pretty much told me, if you're going to do sculpture, you need to do it like the classics or like the Baroque. Okay. But what he did, just like his realism counterparts, is he observed. He looked at actual human beings, all right? A lot of the sculptures that we've seen in the past have been idealized, but he actually observed from real life human beings and not just old statues and sculptures because a lot of your classical sculptors like Michelangelo, they refer to old classical sculptures from studies. All right. They studied anatomy a little bit, but that was still considered a new science. Now it's not. A studying anatomy is a true concrete science. Anatomy, physiology, biology. So by taking those realistic features of science controlling the situation, he observed the anatomy and human anatomy, the science of the human body. And it wasn't light by the population but he was doing what his painting counterparts were doing so that's what makes it a realism sculpture all right so he didn't look at the old statues and sculptures he did but he didn't just base his ugolino and his children based off of classical sculptures he also based it off of observing empirical anatomy of the human all right so that's why it's a realism sculpture then Monet who's going to be very important in the next chapter when we get into impressionism All right he's going to pave the way for it figure 2733 but we'll talk about that let's just later let's talk about this piece and what makes it realism all right remember we're thinking about observation and science those two combined as much as possible to make it realism. This is the luncheon on the grass. Uh, I can't pronounce this, the French uh, Le Dijon sur le herbe. Le Dijon, um, luncheon on the grass. Okay. And we'll look at Monet and then we'll look at Tanner. Now, don't get Monet mixed up with Monet, right? Monet and Monet. All right. You'll see the difference here pretty soon future chapter so what makes this realism is it's a daily life in the industrial Paris okay so he's observing what is actually going on in industrial Paris and it's a contemporary genre scene and also the four figures that are present were real people He's not imagining people. He's not referring to images of women and men from the past. He's referring to four individuals that he knows. And one is his brother who sits there in the middle left of the composition looking out at you next to the lady who's nude looking out at you. Okay. So that makes it realism. He's using real people as his muse into the composition. Also, the attire that they're wearing, or lack of attire that they're wearing, is true to the age and the time. This industrial Paris, France attire in 1863, which is when the painting was done. This is what was worn at that time. There's no emphasis on costuming them or putting theatrical, old classical displays of wardrobe on them or anything leading up to 1863. This is what was worn in the 1860s in Paris, France. So that's what he's portraying, the genre of that truth, okay, the observation. Also, the figure herself who's nude is not idealized. She is representing exactly what her anatomy looks like. So not trying to idealize, just being real. This is who she was. She's completely... Uh, removed of clothes for a reason because this is a study which makes it scientific and I'll explain that in a second but she's not idealized she's left to look realistic to what 
her actual anatomy as one of the four figures looks like. All four of them. This is what their anatomy looks like, which makes it realism. And the study and the referencing, which is making it a scientific painting, is that it combines all these different genres in France leading up to this time frame. It covers, well, I mean, it's studying the critiques of these different European styles that have led up to this realism type of painting. So that is a realistic observation of what has transpired the history of different European styles leading up to this time. So those genres and those styles are referenced in history itself, okay, portraiture, by the two figures looking at you, it is a portraiture because they're observing you, observing them. Okay, portraiture. Still life, you see the bottom to the left is a collection, a copious collection of different, a basket rolled over, the clothing draped, the, uh, the overlapping in depth and spatial recession of different inanimate objects, artfully arranged, so you have still life. You have, so they have portraiture, still life, a focus on history. So the referencing of the European styles is the, is the historical aspect. Landscape, by putting the lady looking as if she's looking for something in the water in the middle ground, it creates an atmospheric perspective in landscape. Okay, so that's landscape, that's a genre. And then the nude having the nude. Often the woman as the nude was a genre style. We saw that in uh, Napoleon with uh, Ingres, with Napoleon's sister that was painted by Ingres. All right. So you have the nude, you have the landscape, you have the still life, you have the portraiture, and then you have the aspect of history. All of those are European styles. And that history depicts an actual contemporary scene. So you have all those European styles, which is, makes this a scientific observation of artful criticism of different styles. And that's what makes it realism. So let's look at an American painter real quick. It'll be the last of our realism. And then we'll talk about photography real quick. And then, uh, then we'll be done with uh, chapter 27. And figure 2739, Tanner, Henry Tanner, the thankful poor, American, out of Philadelphia. Uh, it's, I mean, it's pretty obvious why this is realism. It's a focus on an actual event of prayer and devotion between a grandfather and a grandchild. Okay. Just observing that simple act of life in preparation for eating in reverence together okay empirical observation observing it for what it is now how is that realism enhanced it's enhanced by the nature portraying the dig dignity in the working class and how the dignity is exemplified is that the old man the child and the objects on the table are all detailed. They're all detailed and they're caught in tighter brush strokes of color and light. You can see on his face the, 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 the shadow upon his face showing that concentration in prayer. And then from there, the radiance of the small boy across the table in a glowful thanksgiving upon his face, contrasting his father's concentration in prayer. Almost as if he's casting this light of dignity and devotion over to his grandchild. So that's how the realism of dignity of the, the nature of this working class family is portrayed. It's being observed. But using color and light to emphasize that tighter color and light 
versus everything else the table the chair the background the wall the window the ground even the books that the little boy is sitting on to prep him up to the table or the little stool there that's all done with loose brush strokes so it's not an emphasis on the environment it's an emphasis on the individuals okay so those are looser the environment around them is looser what is tighter and more detailed are the objects on the table that they're thankful for and the individuals themselves and their personal dignity that is an empirical observation of truth of this family so that's what makes it realism all right now the obvious realism is the advent of photography <laughs> i mean it's about as realistic as you can get and we're going to look at uh, Cameron and we're going to look at O'Sullivan real quick. So figure 27.52. Now let me tell you what's going on with photography at this time. Obviously, impure, impure, empirical observation is a big part of realism. So like I've already mentioned several times, what's more powerful than direct observation than capturing it in a lens, emulsifying it, and then printing it out and showing through the emulsification process, showing what is actually being documented. And that's another thing, documentation and communication through information is gonna be a big deal with photography. So a couple things, empirical observing is gonna make it realism with photography, empirical observations, observing. And then also documenting environments is going to be a scientific record so by using photography you can document a scene like we'll see with O'Sullivan you'll document a scene or an event an experience that's human and it will be recorded visually that can be used for historical documentation which is a science whenever you document something on behalf of history it becomes part of science and part of history and that's a big component of realism, science, right? Um, now, with photography, it helped broaden subject matter away from elitism. So it focused on different components of society that were not at the higher elitist level. The camera allowed people to focus on different experiences that had nothing to do with a higher elite. Okay. It had to do with documenting everyday activities. So it was a great mechanical tool of realism and social um, equality to take things that weren't necessarily painted or seen until the realism movement came in, where the painters wanted to document what was going on in, on the ground with everyday folks and then present that in an exhibition space. Photography is doing the same thing. You're able to document what's going on in your backyard, in the park across the street, and then get it emulsified and then display it and uh, communicate it to the greater public. So it was a great way to start to capture. And think about our smartphones. We do the same thing, but now we take it to the next step. We document an activity in our life, we put it on TikTok, right? We turn it into a piece of artwork and compose it on TikTok. We put it on social media, like uh, Instagram, right? Twitter. We take something that's documented in our day-to-day -day life and now we send it out to the public. These folks were your first TikTokers, these first photographers, these realism painters. They were taking something that we're doing every day and then giving it out to the greater public to see, all right? So, it helped do that. It helped get away from this elitism mentality and make the middle class and the working class more um, present, more present. But some of the artists uh, were afraid, thinking that, like I mentioned, it would replace the 2D. Um, and then some thought it was a great tool to help advance 2D art, like, you know, painting and drawing. But one thing that photographers did um, that a lot of people don't know is they actually look to painters to help learn how to compose visually. Like, for example, in still lives and in portraits. 
they would look at still life paintings and still life portraits and see how to arrange the camera in a similar fashion. So the early photographers actually were interested in re uh, researching uh, paintings to help them best with their photography. For example, Cameron and Ophelia study number two, 20, uh, figure 27.52. And what this is, is the portraiture, right? But she went beyond it just beyond. She's also the one who uh, did the portrait of Charles Darwin with the uh, origin of the species. So the photography that went along with him personally, she's the one who did that. Um, and with her portraitures, what she would do is that she would create a narrative. It wasn't just her as a self-portrait. She would use woman subjects to uh, display literary and biblical narratives. So she would dress up the women in a way to reflect these literary, like Ophelia in this case, or biblical individual, wo womanly individuals throughout these uh, different pastimes, if you will. So women were portrayed in literary or biblical attire. So she staged it, just like you would a painting. Um, she would use a short lens that would give this blurred effect, which helped reinforce her literary and biblical narratives, giving reference to history, which is an idea of documentation. Again, a science. Whenever you couple a documentation with that of history, it becomes a form of record, and a record is a form of science. Now, more literally... With documentation, we look at O'Sullivan, figure 27.53, A Harvest of Death, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. So during the Civil War, 1863. And with documentation, he's documenting the Civil War. And then with that, he's communicating to the greater public information that actually happened. Information and truth in human experience which makes it realism. So when you have information and you're communicating it in a record of documentation visually, it becomes a science. And he has to observe it first for it to become a documented, informed science that gets out to the greater public, which shows human experience, which makes it in turn realism. Okay? I'll leave you at that, and we'll move into chapter 28 next.